Jared wrote it, and we were doing this. He wasn't really writing jokes. He was just kind of writing weird, like the characters themselves were jokes, I guess. <laughs> you just went, because it wasn't really right. like, it was just weird stuff we were saying. It feels to me like total commitment. That's where I think the humor comes from, because it's just like not a second where you guys are not totally in character and trying really hard to get make the scene what it is. That's what I feel like. It's not a joke thing. It's not like watching Dirty Rock or something. It's just like every second there's a physical comp, there's something physical happening, or a look, or you, or you and Pedro look so exhausted, or just fall down. Like, and I feel like, I don't think I realized that until I watched it right now, how, and with the response, it was just, it was like listening to a laugh track. What was happening out here? You guys, it was perfect. Like, this is the best uh, half hour comedy ever. Um, yeah, no, that's kind of how I felt because it really was, like, again, like not about the jokes and just kind of weird stuff, but I feel like because everybody committed to creating this world and making people believe that this is a small kind of little contained world in Preston, Idaho, where all these weird characters' lives uh, mix and mingle and and 100% of the time, everybody is playing their character so straight that I think that's why it works. Yeah. Did you know this was gonna happen? Did you guys, when you finished, like high five and just, did you, knew, did you know it was good? I just high five my friend. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was crowd rules. Uh, like, did you know, even if you didn't know this was gonna happen, did you, did you know it was good after? Well, we, we really liked it. I, we always kind of say, you know, we were the original fans because we would finish shooting a scene. And when I say we, I mean really everybody who worked on the film. Every, we were like a big family. Uh, all the crew were like college students along with Jared and I. You know, the only people who really weren't originally part of that family were the other cast members. Uh, but then they quickly became, we all just were hanging out there for about a month in Preston when we shot it. And, so we all just quickly became this little family, and we would I think, assume... I think big love. I know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, big, had a couple compounds and uh, <laughs> tents and chairs. Um, and uh, we would, uh, and as soon as we finished shooting a scene, we would start quoting that scene. Like, it was our <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome, but we really didn't, we had no idea, because being an independent film, you don't know if it's ever going to get distribution. We weren't connected to a studio. We had nobody, you know, overlooking this project. It was just, we got lucky. We had a, uh, our friend, the main producer, who was just a buddy of ours who had a brother who was rich. And he was, <laughs> you know, he was rich comparatively to us. So he was like, fine, here's some money. You know, if it makes, if it makes money, great. If it doesn't, I'm not going to hold against you, but I won't pay for another film. <laughs> And so yeah, he was very, he was very happy. And do you think it helped that you were so young and didn't have that studio, that, like, the, not having that pressure? Did it help make it what it was? Yeah. For, oh, for sure, because we could do whatever we want. We, we, I mean, we were financially limited, but I think so often you see that a lot of, especially in independent film, uh, you see that uh, that. I guess that limit can create so much creative creativity and allows us to really, we had to work within our means, but we didn't want to go above and beyond. If we had more of a budget, would we have been tempted to throw in some CG effects? <laughs> you know, but because of that, the charm I think really comes through with seeing all the real stuff in the town and literally every single high school student in the movie was a high school student who went to that school. And 
you know. And it's sometimes, it's, yeah, so, yeah, no, not so much. She was an actress. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but most of it, like, it's almost like every scene you can play a game where you try to guess who's the actor, who's the hired actor, and then who's the extra, who's like, sweet mom, I'm going to me, you know. It's like the chicken farm scene, there's, t- you know, the two farmers, one of them's an actor and one of them is not. Which one's, which one's an actor? Which, the first or second? Like the older or younger? The older guy is the. Just shut up. That's the real guy. That's the real guy? That's the real guy. So, like, yeah, for sure. His name is Lyle the farmer, and we called him Lyle. He really is the one who shot a cow in real life in front of kids on a bus. <laughs> Jared's, uh, the director's younger brothers had witnessed. Um, they really worked on a chicken farm, and that's the chicken farm they worked on. Um, and he, yeah, Lyle, I think, has been struck by lightning and run over by a tractor and has had a stroke. So it's not funny. I mean, that's right. But he was a great, he was a great sport. He was amazing. Um, I'm going to get do you think being young, even just in make, makes you, make you braver and more committed to thinking the stuff you thought was funny was funny? Did you ever, what, what 24? Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, if, if I got shot every film like that, it would have been amazing because I literally had nothing to lose. I was just, I was a poor college student and I, you know, didn't have anything else to do. And, and uh, you know, I was studying, I was studying film, I was studying uh, stuff, but I, but Jared, when he was like, yeah, we're going to shoot a feature film, I was like, that, that's amazing, I mean, awesome. We would say no to that. And so I think because of that, I could just, I wasn't, I had no preconceptions about how is this going to help my career. I had no career. I, how is this going to affect my image? What was my image? I looked like a boat actor. You know, so, it, and it totally, it totally helped because I think it really helped us all get into character and really uh, enjoy the experience. And, just kind of do our thing and truly focus. And how much direction did they give you in terms of who he was? How much was you and how much was like already in the character before it started? Well, we had done a short film uh, about a year and a half prior to that where we basically established the character. And he and that was a school assignment. And he after we did the short film, Jared, you know, we we had a great time working together. We totally captured that character because he had, he had written it in, you know, it was just a seven page script. I read it, I got it, I was like, okay, I see this. He wasn't obviously 100% there visually, and we didn't know what he looked like, but just the voice and the cadence that Jared would just kind of do his version, be like, Jared, kind of his way of directing, he would tell all the characters, he would kind of mimic how he saw it in his head, and it would be this over exaggerated. Like, Kip was very feminine. He's like, Jesus, what do you think you're doing? And so, the <laughs> rules job was to kind of filter that and like make it more real. And for Napoleon, you know, he's just like, I just want this guy's, Jesus, what the heck are you doing? So, I know, I guess I interpreted that in a different way. It's um, fatigued. Yeah, so. That's really kind of when we came with the character. His wife is the one who's like, I think we should give you a perm. What do you think? <laughs> and, I like, and I honestly, for like a day, thought about it. I was like, because again, I was in college. I wasn't married. I was trying to score chicks. And, uh, I was like, perm. <laughs> Why not? This, this is going to be awesome. I thought Jared was a super talented guy. I was like, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And actually, it was while I scored my wife, and I had that perm. Yeah. Afterwards, she said, no, I, I liked you because of you, not because of that. How long did the perm stay? It's permanent. <laughs> it stayed until I, uh, well, it's a funny thing is because it's such a tight perm, as my hair grew, the grown hair was straight, so it's like I was straight hair with like curly cues. So it looked really ridiculous. I looked like Shirley Temple. And I kept playing with it, but after a while, it's like, all right, it's gotta go. Did you get married during that time, or you waited till? Uh, like your wedding photos? No, that was, that was good. But we did a funny experiment where we strained all my hair during the purchase to see, and it was like, I looked like 
like the line uh, from uh, you know Thundercats or something. Like that. <laughs> um, but yes, that's going back. Yeah, yeah. That's when we established the character. He was made, and Jared said, "Well, you know what? I think like next summer when I want to shoot a feature film, I'd love to be to be in it. I, I'm thinking of a different character." We originally were thinking of doing some like sh shaved head kid with braces and a completely different character. And then after we did the short film, it was big with college students. I mean, that was our you know market, I guess. Like those are the people who saw and loved it. And he was like, I think we have something here. I'm going to do a feature based on this character, and then we're going to do some more, throw in some more characters. And so by the time I read the script, I was I was dying because I just I was so excited to see more of this character and doing more things and then interacting with all these brand new awesome characters like Kip and Pedro and stuff. Yeah, we're just going to throw in some characters and make like a perfect script with not bad moments. <laughs> <laughs> Problem. Did, do you, and did you like, do you still like watching it? I haven't, I haven't seen it in a while. Um, I mean, it's, it's great watching it with an awesome audience, I guess that helps. <laughs> like when it comes on TV, do you, like, do you switch it or do you? Uh, I, you know, I guess if it comes, no, I, I, don't, I don't see it all that much on TV, I and mean, I don't really watch cable or anything. Um, <laughs> it's, it's part of my art. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I haven't seen one, so I literally am now at the time, at that point where I'm wondering if I should introduce my kids to it, because I have so many fans that come up to me with, like, their four-year-olds and little kids who say they're huge fans, and... <laughs> my, you know, my kids are four and six, and so they, and she knows, like my daughter knows that I play it, but she's never seen it, so now I feel like, I don't know. But it's so innocent, too. It's so innocent, like, the, it's, it's the most innocent ending to a movie about, like, ran, randy teenagers I've ever seen. Randy teenagers? Well, I mean, like, it just... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just feel like it's so, it is, it's so uh, innocent. Yeah. So I feel like I'm not surprised that kids, they show their kids. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess, you know, kids, uh, my favorite thing really has been to see, when we first made it and after it was made, I felt like our audience was like eight, like 20 to 35, like a very small audience, just like the young 20-something hipster type, uh, you know, crowd who were going to get this weird, these weird characters. And when we first showed it, I like it's weird. it shows what the power of, I guess, media and, uh, and persuasion can do. But we at Sundance, where it premiered, we had a high school screening. They they always pick every year a film to uh, show to a high school audience to help get the kids, you know, learning more about the arts and culture, a local high school. So they chose our film because they thought oh, it's gonna be perfect. And we watched it, went to the screening, and the kids really weren't. You know, getting it. They were like, it was kind of quiet. They loved the physical humor, like whenever he fell or something like that. But it was pretty quiet. And afterwards, they're like, yeah, I mean, I think they just thought it was cool that they met someone who was in a movie, but they were really into it. And then MTV hopped on later to help promote the film with Fox after it was purchased. And I think it was after it was on TV. Uh, kids are like, oh yeah, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, but anyways, that said, I think with the help of like parents and some kids really loved it. Little kids loved it. I I could never guess whenever I had families coming up to me, who was it that introduced it to who? Because sometimes it'd be the grandparents who are like, oh, we love this movie. We show it to our grandkids. And, our, and they're the ones who are introducing it. You know, it's like, or it's the kids introducing it to their parents, or the parents. It's, I love it for that. You know you get cool status if the grandparents are passing it on to future generations. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you get stopped often, or do they not recognize you? Uh, I, mostly it's my voice that gives me away. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty nice voice. I mean, normally I had to go to Husky mode. <laughs> Um, you do a lot of voice stuff, right? Yeah. I read that and I was surprised because I feel like you look, you, after Napoleon Dynamite, you look much, no, much better. Normally you look <laughs> But normally, like, I feel like sometimes when I feel about, like, child. <laughs> I can get excited when I talk to 
someone who's in a movie too. You know, we're out of that. Um, I feel like normally when I hear about like a child star doing voiceover later, it's because they like didn't grow taller or something. <laughs> so I feel like it's usually the opposite. But so you, you, and but you have lots of voice stuff. Do you like doing voice stuff? I love it. It's fun. Yeah, it's awesome. And getting to you know play around behind the microphone, changing things up is awesome. Um, I like to do. Oh, I, I'm going to later ask you a question about Ashley Simpson on Saturday Night Live, privately, but um, oh. <laughs> we can figure out you have to do Q&A. Okay. I do want to ask you about Ashley Simpson. Oh, okay. but, not Q&A, you have to do questions from these people. Yes. What do we do? Do we give a mic to someone? There's somebody in the audience with a mic. Okay. There's someone okay. hidden in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an air marshal. It's <laughs> like a gun that got a <laughs> There's one in every row. Oh, yeah. there they, that girl right there. Wait, who? Oh, I guess. Uh, How long did you rehearse your dance? Applause, you're too nice. So the dance, it wasn't rehearsed because it was all just freestyle. <laughs> Good fun story behind that was okay. So I liked and I still like to dance. Okay, I like to dance. I said it. Okay? I like to It was weird, but these things are like scientific. Like high school, whatever. I, I guess what I don't know. I guess I do this, but college, I liked to dance, and my main, you know, platform was right after shower, a good shower. I come out, I had mirrors on my closet doors. I turn on Jamiroquai actually a lot in other great disco classics, and um, I would just dance. And it was I literally those were the moves I would just come up with while dancing. And uh, I would do it sometimes for small, select uh, college student audiences. <laughs> Very small. Anyways, I guess his wife got a uh, whiff of that rumor. And so he told me, we put a little dance segment at the end of Paleco, which was the short film. And um, that, that was weird. It didn't work, so we cut it out. But then he says, hey, John, for the feature, I'm gonna, you're going to dance in it. You're, it's going to be the climax of the film. <laughs> Dude, I just like to dance, but it's I'm not like... <laughs> I'm just um, so I was sweating the whole time, just worried about what I'm going to do. And it's like, it's, you know, I mean, there's, again, this wasn't a professional film, so we didn't have a choreographer. And, and yeah, I was like, oh, you'll, you'll be fine. You just, like, do your thing. I was like, should I get a choreographer? So the whole time I'm Thinking I'm going to do something, and, and I end up not doing anything because I don't know how to choreograph stuff. I just listen to my heart. I told Jared, throw in some generic way, throw in some Michael Jackson, throw in some awesome stuff. And so we did three takes where they just put in music and I just started dancing. Um, and then until I would basically be puking my guts out. Like nerves and like just dancing without a break. It's like anyways, doing like spins on a hard floor is really painful. <laughs> Somersaults, not spins. Um, anyways, so that's what we did. We did three, and then they just kind of like they were like that was amazing, and uh, we we'll cut together the, the best parts. But it was hard to choose because they were all the best. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they pretty much edited it. I mean, it was a lot of the same kind of moves, but it was, uh, we didn't know what song we were going to get the rights to, again, being an independent film. It was like, well, we'll try to get something. And then we ended up getting a song that I danced to anyways. Cause, so, that was a blessing. And, uh, it was fun. It was, uh, you know, I still 
try to dance in front of the mirror after shower. <laughs> That's a good one. So that was a really long no, explanation. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, uh, what was exactly going on? Why did it take so long to finalize the deal in Manaya? No, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so can you tell us about the, uh, the, your, your relationship with uh, other cast members uh, while you guys were filming? Can you wait deeper into that? Oh, uh, yeah, so he's asking about my relationship with the other cast members. It was pretty groovy. Um, like I said, the only ones who like, who were kind of part of that group going to school. We were all going, we were all BYU students uh, making this. It was me and, uh, and Aaron Rule, who plays Kevin. Uh, he was a, he was like best friends with the director. So him and I were kind of the only ones who were kind of out of our element. Everybody else, we, they auditioned and hired out of LA. Uh, we had Uncle, you know, John Grice and Uncle Rico, and Efren Ramirez, and Pedro, and these are guys, you know, John Grice who's been in, in you know, the film in the business for ages has done lots of uh, lots of roles. And Efren, who is you know set up somewhat new, and Tina Majorino, who was a child actor, and this was like her first film doing. She did after kind of taking a hiatus. Um, so they all came there, and again, I think because of that mixture, and there's no egos, there's nobody like coming in just like, all right, I need this. Uh, I need this size trailer. I need this, you know, I need my hand to You know, there's nothing like that. They would never have gotten out there. Um, we all just did it because everybody loved the script. So, again, we were like family. And um, um, it was fun because it was, uh, yeah, I don't know, it was amazing. And then for those who saw uh, the animated show that we did a uh, year or so, I guess that was about a year ago. Yeah, those two people. Are so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I don't even know if it's on Netflix. I should be knowing this stuff. You should look it up. It's on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. It's awesome. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, but it was great because that was like a reunion. It was the first time really all the cast got to back together, and so we just totally adored it. We loved it. Um, so yeah, they're great. And we still keep it. Going. We have time for one more quick question. I'll, I'll make this a quick no, one. He's not. It's like cool. uh, the scene where Uncle Rico throws a steak in your face. Uh, <laughs> how many takes did that take, and how funny was that? Uh, <laughs> it was hilarious. Uh, it was. It was awesome. It took actually a lot of takes. With uh, I'm going to go into another long explanation, but I'll make it quick. So they, you know, they kept lobbing. They would shoot. It was like the director, and then some just the prop guy, and then everybody kept taking turns because they were just kind of like underhanded. Nobody could hit me because I was—it's like a long shot, so you—it was hard. And then finally, it was actually John Grice who plays Uncle Rico says, "What are you guys doing? I'm the one who's supposed to be throwing it. I—he actually played baseball, so give it to me. I know what I'm doing." And he overhands it and chucks it, and that's the one that hit me. So. And after that, it was like the glasses right off when I was wearing, like, left this, like, bloody bruise. Uh, and I really, and it was so hard to stay because I was just like, that's going to be it. And that was the only shot we had. Like, as soon as I was over, I was like, uh, I don't think we're going to get it again. So, I think, don't, I, was, I just remember thinking, don't break character, don't break character. It was funny, but I was kind of really kind of like, oh, because it hurts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you saw me put them in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were good. I love tots. Nothing against tots. <laughs> but, I mean, movie food is normally, like, soggy and gross. That was so sound effects when yeah. you were going... <laughs> <laughs> it was not good, but, yes, I do love tots. I'm an advocate. <laughs> Sonic has the best tots. <laughs> Fat Laura, who's <laughs> 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 <laughs>